Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Once again, actually, before we get started on our message, I just want to take a moment and say a prayer. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to come before you and just ask, Lord, that your word be spoken today. I pray, Lord, against my words and just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. I pray that our hearts would be open, our minds would be open to hear. So much of the time you say, for those that have ears, let them hear, eyes to let them see. And so, Lord, we ask that today. Give us the eyes and ears we need. In your name, amen. And Father, or excuse me, um, we are a little further than we were last time in Philippians. Today we are starting Philippians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, then I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Um, we are in Philippians for a very simple reason. This is a book of the Bible that is started as a letter. That's really what it is. We view it as a book of the Bible, but it is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul wrote this letter when he was in prison. And we just felt like coming out of 2020 into 2021, we just thought this is a good thing for us to start in. Because 2021 was so hard. Excuse me, 2020 was so hard. 2021 has been hard so far as well. We need to look at a text that is sitting in a really hard place where the writer of the text is able to identify things like unity and joy and thanksgiving. Because we want to be a people who follow after Christ who also exude those same things, unity, joy, and thanksgiving. And so my prayer is very simple for our congregation, that as we study these scriptures, this particular epistle, that you and I would all find these things. And that beyond that, we would be united in them. That the world around us, when they interact with us, would find that we are people who we just, we sweat it. We exude it. We speak it. Unity, love, joy, thanksgiving. With that being said, let's jump right in this morning. Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. We're going to read a couple of verses, and then we're going to talk about it. You know what? Actually, before I start, I'm going to say this other thing. I said this last week. I'm going to say it again. Philippians has got some deep theology in it. It's good, good stuff. Sometimes it's really easy for us to read scripture and sort of just wash over it. We kind of glance over it. We don't dig in where we need to dig in. And so it doesn't mean that it's not meaningful, but sometimes it could be a whole lot more meaningful if we're willing to dig in. And so this morning, we're only going to do 11 verses. That's all we're doing. We're going to dig into those 11 verses and really just pull the stuff out and talk about it. And at the same time as it's deep, We also must recognize that Paul wrote this letter with the intention of encouraging us. So if we read this sort of deep stuff, we talk about this deep stuff, and we let it divide us, we're reading it in the wrong spirit. The simple truth is, as human beings, we are going to have different opinions, and there's nothing wrong with that. This life is made up of all sorts of stuff where we're going to have different opinions. We're not robots that have to agree on everything. But we're not united by agreement. We're united by Jesus Christ and the work he's done in our lives. And so we need to make sure that is a focal point as we go through some of this stuff, as maybe it pushes our edges and it pushes our envelopes. And this morning, this passage is going to push you. All right? Make no mistake. Some of you have told me you feel like I'm pretty blunt. Sometimes I feel like I'm not blunt. I feel like I'm holding back. Today is going to be one of those blunt days. So let's uh, buckle up and let's go for a ride together. (laughs) Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 1, says this, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. We'll stop there. 
Now keep that out in front of you because we're going to keep coming back to this, okay? Now look, this is a conditional statement. And that might, to you, you might go, what in the world is a conditional statement? Well, you might know it this way. It's an if-then statement. If this, then this, okay? Uh, let's see some examples of an if-then statement. It's kind of two facts is usually what you see. If this is true, then this is true, right? If it rains, then the picnic is canceled. That's an if-then statement, a conditional statement. The condition is if it rains, and the consequence is the picnic is canceled. You have the condition, and you have the consequence, all right? The condition is if it rains, the picnic is canceled. That's the consequence. Consequences aren't always bad. We could say if it's sunny, then the picnic is on. And the consequence is a good thing, right? So consequences aren't bad. It's just the name of that part. So you have the condition and the consequence. Now, there's two kinds of conditional statements, predictive and declarative or factual. Predictive is what it sounds like. It's predicting the future. If it rains, the picnic is canceled. That's a prediction about the future. All right? It's a statement that forecasts the future event. Now, a declarative or factual statement, that's like saying two facts. So if you heat water to 100 degrees, then it will boil. Two facts, right? Not predictive about the future. It's just stating two things. Now, I want you to look back at these first two verses again. All right? These are just a huge if-then statement. So let's look at the first part. Let's look at the condition. All right? So here we go. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. If you have any comfort from Christ's love. If you have any fellowship with Christ's spirit. If you have any tenderness and compassion. Then make my joy complete. All right? It's a big if-then statement. Now, we're going to ask the question, well, how do you make my joy complete? And we'll say that. But here's, here's the thing. My hope and my prayer would be for every single person that is right here, our worship team, that's who's who here right now, um, but also those who are joining us online, that as we say these things, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, you're going, yeah, that's me. I'm encouraged because I'm united with Christ. If you have any comfort from Christ's love, yeah, that's me. I've got comfort from Christ's love. If you have any fellowship with Christ's spirit, yes, I am in fellowship with Christ's spirit. If you have any tenderness and compassion, I hope that people out there have tenderness and compassion because, boy, that's a big part of what it means to look like Christ, right? So I hope that as we read the if part, the conditions of this statement, you're all going, amen, that's me. I have those things. I know that this applies to me, okay? You are fulfilling the condition. So if any of those things are true, then, Paul says, make my joy complete. And we say, well, how? And he says... By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. So if any of you said, those conditions apply to me, you know the next thing is, then this is what you must do, right? That's how this works. If, then, right? The conditions are true, then I need to be like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and purpose. Now, Here's the thing that we often do. We skim this passage. We look over it, and kind of on a 10,000-foot view, we never dig in, 10,000-foot view, we go, okay, so with the people that I'm at church with, people that are in my community, I need to be like-minded with them. I need to have the same love as them. I need to be one in spirit and purpose. This sounds like it's a good like, team thing, like yeah, be on the same page, hands in, on three, everybody yells, go Jesus, and we, you know, we do our thing, right? That's kind of what it sounds like. Be like-minded with the people around you. However, that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I hope that we can all be like-minded. I hope that we can all be of one spirit and purpose. I, I pray that. But this is not calling you to be like-minded with each other. It's not calling you to have the same love as you. You are supposed to have the same love as you. Nope, that's not what it's saying. It's calling you to be like-minded with Christ. It's calling you to have the same love as Christ. You're supposed to be one in spirit and purpose with Christ. You're not convinced yet? Look back at the scripture. Look back whose love, whose spirit, whose unity is being discussed. What's it say? United with Christ. Comforted from Christ's love. Fellowship with the Spirit. All of that refers to Christ, not to each other. 
Now, here's why this is important. Especially in the day and age that we live in. A day that is marked by division, a day that is marked by disagreement, a day and age that's marked by rivalry, by political conflict, that's marked by spiritual isolation and detachment and estrangement. If we were calling you for your love to look like your love and your purpose to look like your purpose, you'd be in a tug of war, essentially. All right? I have the right purpose, so I'm going to just tug you until you come over to my purpose. What does that create? That creates a winner and a loser. Think about a tug of war. Somebody wins and somebody loses. All right, well, I'm going to call you over to my kind of love. I have the right love. Somebody is a winner and somebody is a loser when we do that. And even if you pull somebody over to your side, you convince them somehow, maybe with a great argument, or you just badger them until they give up, how often are they happy about it? When you win an argument, maybe you win up here, but very little do you win here. They still feel angry and frustrated with you, right? When you pull a person to your side, that's not really a journey. That's a dead end. That's one direction. And if I am telling you that you need to have the same spirit as me, that means I'm telling you that you need to let go of your spirit. If I'm telling you you need to have the same love as me, then I'm telling you that you need to let go of your love. If I'm telling you that we need to have the same purpose, that means giving up your purpose. And that's wrong. That is wrong, and it is silly. Because it's not my mind, it's not my spirit, and it's not my love that you're supposed to look like. We are both supposed to look like Christ's love, Christ's mind, and Christ's spirit. Because here's what happens. When it's about you and me, we tug each other back and forth. But when we introduce Christ's mind, spirit, and love, suddenly, rather than doing this and getting nowhere, we start doing this. Closer and closer and closer. And guess what? The closer that you and I get to Christ's love and his spirit and his purpose, the closer we get to having the same spirit and love and purpose. The problem is that so many churches start with, you got to look like us. you got to do it our way. No. You need to look like Jesus Christ. You need to do it Jesus Christ's way. And then if we all do that, we all start looking more like each other too. We're on message together rather than being apart. So, let me get really blunt. Hey, Christians. In this age of Democrat versus Republican, this is not about moving to some sort of moderate middle ground view. This is about moving to a place that looks more like Christ. You are not, you are not a Democrat that is a Christian. You are not a Republican that is a Christian. You are a Christian first. You follow God first. You prioritize the mind, the spirit, the love, and the purpose of Christ first. The other stuff comes after that. And the problem is that much of the time, our politics are becoming an idol. Or or perhaps we've, we've gone by that. Perhaps we overshot that already. And our politics are an idol. It's not about becoming. They just are. And because they are, we have so much trouble seeing around the donkey or the elephant or the golden calf that we've put into our own path. We can't see the plan or the process or the spirit or the purpose of Christ because that thing is standing between us. The problem isn't that you care about politics. The problem is you care more about winning politics than you do about being like-minded, having the same love, or the same purpose as Jesus Christ. So what we're doing is we are literally prioritizing division. The very division that Paul is speaking against we prioritize that over having the same mind, the same purpose, the same love, the same spirit as Jesus Christ. How's that for blunt? So let me read it again. In light 
of all that I just said. Let me read it again. So, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded with Christ, by having the same love as Christ, by being one in spirit and purpose with Christ. That is our priority, not winning silly arguments, okay? That has to come first. (laughs) Let's keep going. Uh, Verses three and four, here we go. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. We'll pause there. If you remember last week, we talked about preachers who Paul had encountered who were all about self-promotion. They they did their preaching out of uh, jealousy or or envy from Paul. Now, finally, Paul's kind of speaking out against it. He says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't just look at yourself. Because that's what ambition, selfish ambition and vain conceit is, is you looking at yourself, right? That's you looking in the mirror and saying, all right, how am I doing? Oh, 20-year plan, let's look in the mirror. Well, I don't like what I'm seeing. I gotta change this, this, and this. That's looking in a mirror is how you get at those things. And Paul's saying, okay, instead of looking at yourself, get the mirror away and look through a window. Look at the world around you. Look at others. Don't just care for your needs. Care for other people's needs. In this country... In our culture, we look in mirrors all the time. Throw away the mirrors. Start looking through windows. Because there's a whole big wide world out there. And it starts with your neighbor, the people who need you, people who need you to care, to just, to give. The self-centeredness that only looks to your interests needs to be replaced by an others, other-centeredness. That spirit replaces ours. Now, hear this. We aren't supposed to ignore our own affairs in order to step into other people's lives and be good for them. God is not calling you to walk away from your family, to ignore your children, to ignore your responsibilities in order to do good works with other people. That's that's not what is being said. Paul is not calling you to replace your concern for yourself and your family with concern for others. He's calling you to add concern to other, for others to what you already care about. It's addition, not replacement. Because the honest truth is that it is easy to slip into the habit of ignoring the pain and the heartache and the suffering that goes around us every day. And I've, I've been there that you feel helpless What do I do? How do I help that person? And so what it does is it becomes easier to ignore them. It becomes easier to close the shutters so you can't see what's going on around you. I remember back in 2010, 2009, 2009, post the recession, as a youth pastor, I had kids meet me in town at the coffee shop, and then we took one hour where they took a notebook and they walked around our community and they wrote down observations of what they saw. And for so many of those kids, it was the very first time any of them had walked in town. They had driven through it a million times. They drove by all those stores and all those houses a million times to get to school, but they had never taken the time to just walk around and be like, oh man, those windows are broken. Oh, that's really run down. Oh, that person has a hole in the porch right in front of their door. They finally came face to face with the needs because instead of looking in a mirror, they started looking through a window. The world needs us. We have a good message. We have a good heart. And we are called to care for them. It's too easy to say it's not my problem. Stop saying that. And and hear me. (laughs) Not every problem is your problem. All right? There, there are some of you that probably should stop interjecting yourself in other people's lives. I guess I should say that. We all have different growth areas. Some of you need to take a step back from interjecting, but some of you have to get off the couch and start standing up and doing something. 
it's very easy for selfish ambition to say, look, I'll do more when I'm done with me. I'll help fix that when I've fixed me. I'll give more when I get more, right? That's not what we're called to. That's not the spirit that Jesus is speaking into us. The spirit we're being spoken into us is one that adds to our interests, the interests of those around us. God is putting those things in front of you for a reason. So we need to start praying that God opens our eyes, that we have his eyes, right? Okay. Starting at verse 5, it's going to get thick. This is like such fun stuff for me. I'm going to try really hard not to go into any sort of like deep rabbit holes for you. But seriously, I could do another master's just on this passage. It is so fun. All right, so let's, let's read this, all right? Verses 5 to 7. Um, your attitude should be the same as that, is, uh, that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And we'll pause. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. We could fairly and literally translate that as keep thinking this attitude among you, which was in Christ Jesus. So I want you just to picture, you know, eight months down the road or a year from now, sometime when we can have a big fellowship event. We're going to have a, a big chicken thing out at the pavilion, and so there's people in the kitchen downstairs getting ready to get all that stuff out there, and they're talking, they're working, and they're running into some problems, they're struggling a bit. Somebody's starting to feel pretty frustrated with something, and, and, and somebody leans over and says, hey, keep that mindset of Christ Jesus. Hey, keep that attitude of Christ Jesus. You're doing good. I know it's hard. Keep that attitude of Christ Jesus. I mean, that's, that's really kind of what Paul's doing. He's like, hey, you guys should have the attitude that was of Christ Jesus. The King James actually, I think, says it better than the NIV. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's like, it's like an encouragement and also a piece of accountability for us. Hey, you're doing good. I know you're getting frustrated, but remember, keep that attitude of Christ Jesus. Imagine saying that to somebody in just love. Not in, not in like, oh, I'm right and you're wrong. Not in I'm going to try and beat you down with that. But in a moment of genuine compassion, love, and fellowship where you come up around somebody who you are working with, who you are representing Christ with, and you lift them up, you encourage them, you provide a slight amount of correction for them to get them right back on course. Hey, remember, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Now, Paul makes two statements. First one is this. Jesus existed in a form that was God. Maybe that's obvious to you. Believe it or not, a lot of theological debate over some of that kind of stuff, right? This is the stuff that if we let it could divide us. And I'm, you wouldn't be surprised, I'm sure, to learn that churches split over these sort of things, right? But here's the statements. Jesus existed in a form that was God. And Jesus did not consider this equality something to be held on to. That's amazing, if you think about it. Jesus did not consider this equality something to be held on to. Now, in case you have any curiosity at all, when Paul writes this, he writes this in Greek in a tense that is both present and future, which means that the nature of Jesus that is the same as God isn't just is, but it will be. It is now and ongoing forever. Jesus is now equal to God and is always equal to God. Now he says he made himself nothing. Some Bibles would translate that probably like he emptied himself or something like that. The word empty maybe is in there. Um, and you might think, well, he emptied himself of what? And, and this is this is a, a Greek word, kanoa, and we get the word kenosis from there, and so now I'm getting a little deep, but there are theories. Kenosis just means self-emptying. And there are theories that suggest that self-emptying, kenosis, is related to releasing your will and being entirely receptive to God's will. I buy that, all right? Releasing your will and being entirely receptive to God's will. And if you think about the passage, this is a passage about Jesus descending. 
from his equalness with God, from all that power, he descends down into the form of man and becomes a servant. This is a descending, right? And so it makes sense to me that Jesus chooses God's will. He puts, he becomes entirely receptive to God's will rather than his own. Other theories of kenosis, self-emptying, suggest that Christ gave up his divine nature. And I'm not on board with that without having some really significant discussion. Like, in-depth discussion. On the surface level, I'm not on board. And here is why. This is an important concept for us to understand, which is why I'm going there. The line says that Christ takes on the nature of a servant. The word take is lambano, and this word doesn't imply exchange. It applies, implies addition. Okay? So how does that work? Think about a woman who becomes a mother. Mother is added onto woman. Woman does not give up woman to become mother. So I'm sure it feels like that sometimes. Motherhood is added to woman. Think about a math equation. Two plus two equals four. Both twos are represented in the four. It's different to say, give me your two, I'll give you four. Right? That's exchange. Now, when Christ takes on the nature of a servant, it is added to his previous nature. What's the previous nature? It says, equal with God. It's added on to. And so, this is a beautiful mystery of our faith that we could spend a lot of time talking about, but I'm not going to this morning. I just want you to sit back for a moment and appreciate with me that God, that Jesus can be both God and man at the same time. This is how we get the beautiful miracle of incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us, that thing that we celebrate at Christmas all the time, God comes to us. This is where we get that. It's something that we should celebrate more often than just Christmas time because this is, this is the thing that sets Christianity apart. God leaves all of that power. He leaves all of that privilege and he descends down to us to be on our level and not just on our level, but to be a servant and somehow retains his divineness at the same time. Beautiful, beautiful mystery of the faith. Now let's keep talking. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, we just spent a few minutes talking about how God retains his godness. Uh, I don't have anything really more to say on that, except to remind you of this. It's really easy for you to interact with this with just your head. It's really easy to come at this from a scholarly standpoint. It's really easy to just be thinking about your faith, to be thinking about the words that are written in Scripture. But we need to do more than that. It can't just be this cerebral thing. We need to interact with the Bible as a, an artist, as a musician, as a poet. We need to use our heart. I mean, there are some theories that suggest that the very passage we're talking about this morning was an early Christian hymn, that this was something that they sang together. And so Paul uses this because people would have been very familiar with this old-timey hymn. And so think about all the old-timey hymns that you know. And think about the deep theology that is in them, has been taught by them. And, and maybe Paul took a hymn and he used this as a way to, to just talk about who Jesus is. We need to connect with Jesus. We need to connect with Scripture. We need to connect with our faith, not with just our head, but our hearts. And the arts are a way to do that. We all connect in different ways. Some of you learn very well by listening, some through sight. Some of us, like myself, were tactile, right? Got to use our hands. I sat in a lot of Sunday school classrooms for a lot of years as a kid, and I just couldn't get, this thing didn't make sense to me. It just didn't find its way into my heart in the way that it once did. But through missions trips and working at summer camps and doing internships and working with at-risk youth ministries, I like literally got to dig my hands in and just 
walk in the midst of this thing called the gospel. And that's when it took root for me. So we all learn different ways. And every BIC church is different, and Kanoi is not like every other BIC church out there, but just think about how the arts draw us in in a whole different way. Think about when you go to some of those cathedrals that are built so high and so magnificent and so big, and you walk in, and you can't do, you can't help but look up at the heavens because everything draws you up. That's something different than when I just get into scripture. Think about um, some churches I know have artists that go to the church that paint pictures, and they put those pictures up in different places around the church, and you can stand in front of a piece of artwork, and you can just appreciate what it's trying to portray to you is so differently than getting into just reading my Bible or cerebrally understanding some bit of theology. I think about, I've been to churches before where they've had an artist on the stage who's painting a picture while the, the pastor is giving a sermon and they connect to each other and so people are listening to God's word being spoken to explain while they're watching a picture develop in front of them and it mimics the development that's going on in each of our spirits. Or think, about, think about people who understand how sometimes things can look really busy and so imagine a stage that where you can't see all the cords and the monitors and all of that stuff. Suddenly that disappears and you're not distracted by it anymore because people care about the visual arts as a way to connect us. We need to connect with this thing, not just with our heads. Yes, we want to know Scripture. Yes, we are called to use Scripture. We read that passage from 2 Timothy. All Scripture is useful. We need to know it. But God wants to capture our heart. And so if it's all up here, then we are missing something. And sometimes it can be really hard to see things change. So when a church, a church suddenly starts, you, you see artwork appear. You see certain changes being made that are meant to draw you in in a whole new way. Man, that can make some people really uncomfortable. We used to say at one of the churches I worked at that it was time for people who always sat in the same pew spot to move over and make room for new people to sit in that pew spot. We're all called to this great humility. And sometimes we have to recognize it's not about us, it's not about what we want, it's about others connecting with God. And so at that church, if that person's been sitting in that pew spot for 10 years, and there's a new person that comes in who needs a spot, I would hope that the person who's been sitting there for 10 years would be willing to give up their pew spot for this new person to sit down and connect with God, right? That's, this passage is about a great humility. It's about the humility of Jesus Christ descending from a place of incredible power, incredible privilege, equality with God, to taking on servant taking on human servant, to take it on the level of appearing as a man, as the scripture says, and then obeying the Father's plan, even when it meant persecution, conviction, humiliation, a beating, and yes, as the scripture says, obedience to death, even death on a cross. See, this great humility is something that you and I are supposed to be one mind, one spirit, and one love with. You should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature equal to God, descended down and took on the form of human servant and obedience, obedience even to death on a cross. We are all called to this great humility, all of us. And that looks different in everybody's lives. How does that apply to us today? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna share it. An old mentor of mine, his name is Gene Winger, was a pastor in the Brethren of Christ for a long time. I worked with him at E-Town Brethren of Christ Church for some years, and then we got to work together again at Kembrook, and while we worked together at Kembrook, Gene passed away. Uh, it was hard. Recently, or back in August, his daughter came across, going through his stuff, came across a sermon that he gave. A sermon he gave in 1991. 
on the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. And he wrote a sermon called, When Rights Are Wrong. And I want you to hear this today. How does a great humility apply to us today? Especially living in a world where we are so about my rights. I can't find a spot in the Gospels where Jesus pounded his fist against something and said, this is my right, that's my right, you're taking away my rights. So hear this, these are the words of Jean, but I, I pray them onto all of us. Rights are wrong when we seek our own interest and violate the law of self-giving love. Rights are wrong when they do not build up another. Rights are wrong when they do not work toward the righteousness of God. Rights are wrong when they cause others to stumble. Rights are wrong when they are not exercised under the will of God. Rights are wrong when they're used to get advantage and privilege. Rights are wrong when they do not express the love of Christ when he emptied himself of all but love. Rights are wrong when they are out of variance with the way we have been treated by God. Now look, those words probably didn't make Gene popular in 1991. And they may not make me popular today, and that's okay. Because we fist pound about a whole lot of stuff. And the one thing I don't hear us fist pounding about is how God calls us to give up. Give up our rights. Give up our stuff for the sake of others. Are you willing to try and have the same mindset as Christ? Are you willing to lay aside your own will, your own rights, your own desire, your own benefit, and follow Jesus, even though it might cost you everything? I think about that. Don't answer it lightly. Are you willing to give up all of that so that you can follow Jesus even though it might cost you anything? Because listen, Jesus gave it all up for you. Everything. He gave it all up for you. He laid aside his power and his privilege and his rights. He could have stomped his foot. He could have banged his fists. And he didn't lay it aside because he wanted to just feel what it was like. He's not some Greek god that comes off of Olympus because he fell in love with a human woman and then he goes back where he, he came from. Jesus Christ gave it all up so that you and I can be restored to our relationship with God. That is why. It was not empty. It was not devoid. It was not a avoided check. He gave it all up for us. Now are we willing to do the same? Are we? Will we do it for him? When he calls us to have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus, who gave it all up and descended down to the form of a servant and obedience, obedience, where you lay aside your own will, you empty of your own will and you take on the will of the Father and you lay down your life, even to death, even to death on a cross, are you willing to do that? That is the example of Jesus Christ. That's why the definition of love, there is no greater love than laying down your life for another. That's, that's because Jesus defines it right here. So we need to stop fist banging about the stuff that doesn't matter or the stuff that matters to this world. We need to stop deciding that we're going to stomp our foot like a little child when things don't go our way because that's what the rest of the world is doing. Guess what? The call of Jesus Christ on your life should set you apart from the rest of the world. So if you find yourself going with the crowd, you better start asking hard questions. I'm sorry. I'm getting worked up. Let's keep reading. Philippians 9 to 11. We're going to finish it out. I'm so sorry. I, I just, I love Jesus, and I just feel like the call that he places on us is just so all the way through us. 
and we can spend this lifetime, this short little lifetime that we have of just letting it get skin deep, and we miss so much. We miss so much of what we are being called to and so much of the change that Jesus is looking to do in this world. And if we don't dig in and we don't say, look, this thing is going to go deeper than skin deep, then I don't know that we're doing this thing. Uh, then we are lukewarm. And, and there are some harsh words for being lukewarm, folks. Spit out of your mouth. And I don't want to be that. I don't want to lead you that way. And I don't want you to be that. So if I get worked up, I apologize. But guys, this is serious stuff. This is what we're called to. Verse 9, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And just a fun note, the Greek word for exalted has the word hyper in front of it. And so if you wanted to literally translate it, you could say that therefore God super exalted him to the highest place, which I think is pretty cool sounding. So therefore God super exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let me just give you a little historical context. Close your eyes for just a moment and listen to these words from Scripture. This is from Isaiah 45. It says, By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. Romans 14, Paul writes this. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. And it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Revelations 13. Then I heard. Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and all the elders fell down and worshiped. Open your eyes. These are words of encouragement to us. That someday every tongue will confess. That someday every knee will bow. These are promises that do not just show up in a letter to a church in Philippi. These are promises that are in the Old Testament that walk all the way through until the very end. And when John writes down this vision in Revelation, he describes once again every tongue confessing, every knee bowing. This is encouragement to us. This is Paul saying, hey, Friday is here, but Sunday is coming. It's that sort of moment. He's saying, though you face humiliation, as did our Lord and Savior when he was arrested in the dead of night, given a mock trial, when he was stripped and beaten in public, when he was forced to carry his cross through the streets as people spit on him, as they kicked him, as they jeered him, when he was hung on the cross and died the death, not of a God, but of a criminal, Though you may face persecution like that, though you may face humiliation like that, you too will be born again. You too will inherit a heavenly body. You too will rise from the dead and join God and experience victory. Paul's words are meant to encourage us because victory is ours. And we stand with the one who is super exalted. Victory is ours. Told you I was going to give you five takeaways every time. Let me give you your five takeaways today. A reminder of kind of where we've been. Number one, it is not about you and I having the same spirit, same love, and the same mind. It's about us having the same as God's mind and God's spirit and God's love. And when we are all united in that, when we will all start looking more like Jesus. Our minds and our wills will start lining up because we've chose to line them up with God. Number two, self-centeredness must be replaced with other-centeredness. As a reminder, that does not mean that you give up the responsibilities you've taken on. If you're a father, be a father. If you're a mother, be a mother. If you have parents that are aging and sick, take care of them. You have concerns that you need to take care of. But add to that the window, not the mirror, 
but the window you will look out of and begin to see the world that needs you. And you can't do it all. You can't. And if you try and do it all and you kill yourself doing it, you're not any good to anybody. So take it in pieces. Take it one at a time. And remember that you have friends, you have family, you have a community of believers who stand with you in the gaps that life has before you. Number three, we need to connect with God, not just with our head. We need to connect with our heart. And if we are used to doing things in a certain way, it might be time for us to move over in the pew and make some space for somebody new. Right? Number four, when rights are wrong. Remember the words of Gene with me. Start banging your fist about the right stuff. Scripture has a lot to say on rights. It really does. Every one of those lines that I read that Gene wrote, I can go right to Scripture, and we can dig right in. Consider when rights are wrong. Number five, victory. Victory is ours in Christ. Victory is ours. I'm going to close with this. In Romans chapter 8, Paul, again, same Paul who writes the letter we're reading today. He writes about suffering. He writes about persecution and the tribulation he's going through. And he says this, what shall we say in response to all of this then? If God is for us, who can be against us? Put this world in perspective. Put your suffering in perspective, my friends. A worldwide pandemic. If God is for us, who can be against us? A political nightmare. If God is for us, who can be against us? A terrible diagnosis. If God is for us, who can be against us? A loved one disappoints you. If God's for us, who can be against us? A loss, an addiction. You've been overlooked because of your your gender, your skin color, or how much money you don't have. If God is for us, who can be against us? Victory is ours because we stand with him who is super exalted. Let's pray. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together. Thank you.